Hello, hello, wonderful people. I'm Jay. Hope you're doing well, and you are watching DS Tech Media. And today we are going to be looking at Linux specifically. Um, we're going to be looking at things that you can do with Linux and why you might want to use Linux as the platform for doing those things. So specifically, we will be looking at content creation and media production. Uh, this is going to be a new series. The series is Linux. Do everything freely. And like I said, this one is specifically media and content production, like what I'm doing here right now. So, um, why would you want to use Linux for media and content production? Well, the GNU Linux base OS is relied on by most, if not all, governments, major governments across the world. And it powers most of the internet. It powers Amazon, Facebook, Twitter, Google, Netflix. Nearly every major tech company uses Linux in a huge way. Even Apple and Microsoft. Google, specifically, uses Linux to create all of their software and their services. And uses it to power those services. And they use it as an actual product in Android and Chrome OS, which are running on Linux. So another reason would be that Linux is free and open source software. And that means that usually it's free, not always free as in cost, but there's a lot of freedoms that open source grants you. And when the source code is available, more eyes are on it. And that provides more security as well as more innovation and development. It also allows for bugs to be found much faster. Um, Linux doesn't just include free software. It includes non-free open source software. Of course, free and open source software. As well as closed source non-free proprietary software, and even open source non-free proprietary software. There's tons of options just like on Mac or Windows. Generally, free and open source software is made by people who want to make good software, who care about making good software. There's passion in it. Uh, a lot of times they're making it because they need the software that they're making. So they're literally making something that they need to use. Because it's open source, anyone with the skill or the, the drive can take what's already there and make it better or just make it different, make it their own, make it uh, original in some way. I make this entire channel with Linux and free and open source software. Well, I use Android for certain things, or I will be in the future. So maybe not entirely Linux, or some of my software is probably not free. For instance, uh, right now I'm recording this using an NVIDIA Quadro graphics card with NVIDIA's proprietary drivers. So that that's non-free software. For the most part, there has never been anything that I couldn't do with Linux that I set out to do. I'm hoping that this channel will be an example to people who maybe don't know about what you can do with free and open source software. And then I'm, you know, I'm not the best. I'm, I'm just learning a lot of this for the first time for myself. Linux is very customizable. Uh, creative t people tend to want to customize their tools and their workspaces and Linux is extremely good for for that. You may want to get away from your reliance on proprietary software or hardware. I know 
recently, maybe not with the latest MacBook Pros, but the, the ones before that, um, coders who relied on MacBook Pros religiously were were severely disappointed with the specs. I, I don't think they could get any more than 16 gigs of RAM, which was just not enough for a lot of their uses. So they they were forced to, to leave Mac and go go to um, PC. And some of them were already running Linux, but other ones, you know, they didn't want to go to Windows, so they, they used Linux, which is, is closer to Mac than Windows. With Windows 10, uh, when people upgraded to Windows 10, a lot of them found that the drivers that they were using were no longer available on Windows 10. Uh, that's the same case with a lot of the software and tools and and apps that they were using. Um, when you're using proprietary software, if the company goes out of business, that software is done unless they sell it and development continues on it. With Linux and free and open source software, there's almost always going to be a way that a community can keep maintaining and producing the software. Um, also, there's, for the most part, everything you make using free and open source software is yours. You're not send it, signing an end user license agreement with stipulations for how you can use it. it the free part is just a much, as much about your freedom as it is the lack of cost. Now, who shouldn't use Linux? I would say people that are heavily invested in proprietary solutions like Adobe who are not willing to learn new things and willing to deal with difficulties and people who aren't open to learning basically. Also, if if you're stuck with, uh, if you rely on some kind of hardware, I don't know, your camera or your recording solution, if it's tied to a software that you can only use in Mac or Windows, then you probably aren't going to want to use move to Linux if you're severely, if you've invested a lot of money in that sort of thing. But for the most part, Linux supports more hardware than any other operating system. I know uh, one one example was uh, Focusrite Scarlet Generation One audio interfaces for recording. Um, people who were using those on Windows 10, the upgrade update came out, and in order to use those, you were using the ASIO drivers, and they no longer worked for the Generation 1 of Focusrite Scarlet. So you either had to buy Generation 2 or get something else. That That's not going to happen with, with Linux or with free and open source software for the most part. A really good example of a use case is if you had, like, this machine that I'm using here. When I got this machine, it didn't have an operating system. So it was good hardware that was going to be thrown away. And with Linux, I can take it and immediately get value out of it. And it doesn't, it doesn't matter what hardware it is. It, any hardware can run Linux for the most part. So we're also going to look at the alternatives there are from free and open source for uh, common proprietary solutions. Proprietary solutions like Adobe. Now I, I know that one of the things that got me into using computers as a teenager was doing uh, photo manipulation and graphics design and the only way to do that the the main way to do that was through Adobe Photoshop so I've been using Adobe Photoshop since I was 15 14 and 
I've had pirated copies of of Photoshop for years and probably my first experience with GNU was with GIMP. GIMP is the GNU image manipulation program and it is probably the best alternative to Adobe Photoshop. Uh, Krita is another one. It's more like a advanced paint type system. As I said, I was into graphics design. Uh, I didn't know at the time about what real graphics designers used, which was uh, Adobe Illustrator. And Inkscape is a great alternative to Adobe Illustrator. Definitely a pro level replacement for Illustrator. I've, I've known at least one company personally that used Inkscape for uh, advertising and design. And it, it can be used for uh, CNC and all, all different types of industrial applications. So if you're a photographer, uh, Adobe Lightroom is probably how you're developing your RAWs. And we have Darktable, which I've seen pro photographers that left behind Lightroom for dark table specifically because they wanted to move to an open source photography software stack and then of course adobe premiere um i use Kden live these these are all my personal uses that i'm listing here with the exception of krita which i'm going to show you but i do not personally use it Okay, so we're going to start with GIMP and Krita, which are our Adobe Photoshop alternatives. And I'm using Ubuntu 1804 LTS, which is a very mainstream Linux distribution. Uh, this is a common desktop for people to start off with Linux between Ubuntu 18.04 or Linux Mint I believe it's Linux Mint 19 and we're using GIMP 2.10 which is the latest version and I actually started using GIMP before I had ever even tried Linux I um, I hadn't really been doing anything with design or photography and I, I needed it to do something real quick. I didn't feel like getting a pirated copy of Photoshop. So I ended up downloading GIMP. And I was amazed. So I made this. This is probably like 8 years old. And uh, this was a picture of a field. I added some filters to it. I found this picture of a cabin. I... Uh, copied it out of there and pasted it in here and this background is actually a spray paint over spray and this was a picture of smoke that I, I colorized and you know it's easy to be creative and this is a collage of things out of uh, one of my uh, black books. Uh, I had a lot of friends that were graffiti writers. This is my friend Scott. And my uh, ex-girlfriend did a lot of this stuff. And I'm going to show you how these layers were added together. So yeah, it's easy to just composite. And we, we've got awesome selection tools. We can select by color. And then we've got a bunch of uh, 
bunch of brushes that are already included. You can even make your own brushes. It's just an extremely, extremely powerful program. And you can tune the brushes down to tons of detail. So let's try this one. This one's a cool one. Like I said, I'm, I'm just trying to give you an idea of some of the things you can do. Not bad. We can draw with masks. We can manipulate the different channels. There may be some things in Photoshop that are uh, easier. There might there might be some automation built in. You you can achieve the same results with GIMP. You just have to be willing to learn it. I know that coming from Photoshop the shortcuts and everything were different. Uh, this here was another graffiti book sketch from another friend of mine named uh, Brian. Uh, the word is Zeus, Z-E-U-S. And uh, this is made from a scan. Same with this, this was a scan. And I, I actually scanned these on Windows. This was years and years ago. But I since have brought them to Linux and cleaned them up. This is the magic wand tool. So here I'm using one of the preset brushes. And you have a variety of color selection tools and palettes to pick from. So I just sped this up because I wanted to show all of the changes I made here without wasting a ton of time for you, the viewer. And that's not bad for an improvised little edit there. Oops. And now we're going to look at Krita. And yeah, I don't really have a lot of experience with Krita, but I know that Krita is a very powerful painting program. It's good for illustrators. Krita is somewhere between Inkscape and GIMP, I guess you could say. I actually would like to learn Krita because it has a really cool right-click system. You right-click and you just get all of these awesome options. Okay, and we have a magic wand tool here as well. I mean, it's already, it's obviously an awesome, awesome tool. Here, I wanna show you what, what people who know what they're doing can do with GIMP. These are all done with GIMP. I'm sorry, with Krita. That actually looks like it was done with GIMP though. Okay, so now on to Inkscape. And Inkscape is uh, what I would consider more traditional graphics design tool. Uh, this is version 92, the latest stable version. And all of my graphics that I use for, you know, my logo, for my channel, for everything, I do all of that with Inkscape. Background that I did for a Linux distribution called Arch Merge. This Arch shape was based off of the original Arch Linux logo and they added some customization to it and I took the Arch Linux font and made it say Arch Merge and inset it 
And these, of course, are scalable vector graphics. And here is the DS Tech logo. These are literally like evolutions of it. Some work I was doing, I was creating some interfaces for the YouTube channel, which this is the one we were using earlier. And there's the, the current iteration of the logo. And here is yet another background for a Linux distribution. This is for another favorite of mine, which is Elementary OS. Okay, so this was the original drawing my friend Brian did. And I actually traced it in Inkscape, which now makes it a vector, which means we can manipulate it like a vector and do all kinds of interesting things. I should also mention that GIMP, Krita, and Inkscape use their own files, but they can import their Adobe counterparts. So Adobe Illustrator drawings, Photoshop documents, etc. and so forth are compatible with the open source software I'm showing you here. Okay, so back to the raw editing. There's actually more than one way to develop raw photos on Ubuntu Linux. I think this is the only one I've seen uh, professionals recommend. So we've got three tabs here. We've got the light table, the dark room, the other. The other is a map that shows you everywhere in the world the photos were taken. The slideshow is pretty self-explanatory. The light table is just a bunch of ways to import manage the photos that you have. This is one of my favorite photos that I have ever taken. And as you can see, this was taken on my Google Pixel XL. It's got your focal length, your exposure, and your aperture. No lens because it doesn't really apply. But yep, that was taken on an Android smartphone. As were every one of these. And we can... go in and edit so here's the original it's already an extremely sharp photograph but this is what it looks like after i've sharpened it more see over here we've got active channels or modules favorites i don't have any favorites though basic group tone group color group correction group and effects group as you can see over here, you've got your history of all your changes to the photo, original, and this is a non-destructive editor, meaning that the original photograph is always preserved, and you're actually able to make snapshots, or basically just copies of your, your edits. And we can come in here and adjust things in different ways. Obviously, we've got a curve for this one, a Bezier curve, and we can adjust with the slider. If we scroll or hold and left click, and if we right click, we get this uh, curve for uh, more visual control, and this is truly an awesome editor. I would say that Raw Therapy, Luminance HDR, and dark table probably the only uh real contenders for uh raw processing okay so up next would be caden live which is what i use it's my best recommendation as an alternative to adobe premiere 
but we're gonna hold off on that and we're gonna look at um, what I use for screen capturing and live streaming there's two ways that I go about doing it a uh, simple screen recorder is a program that's only for Linux you can actually use simple screen recorder for streaming to YouTube and maybe some other services uh, I, I don't use it very much though for the most part OBS is what you're gonna want to use if you're recording your screen or doing doing any type of work like this open broadcaster studio is available on Mac Windows and Linux Having OBS on Linux is uh, it's really a game changer. Without OBS, content creation on Linux would not be on par with other operating systems. Here you can see OBS on my screen. And we can go ahead and turn on studio mode. Okay, so all of these are my scenes. And here on the left side, this is actually my other screen. I use two screens with my current setup. And I can watch uh, my CPU usage, which is pretty low because we're using uh, NVIDIA's NV encoder. Uh, it shows you your hard disk space, your memory usage, etc. If you're streaming, if you're recording. Also, uh, this is a uh, calf. This is where I host all my audio processing plugins. So my voice is being processed through there. And this shows me uh, how Jack's doing. So over here you've got your basic controls, streaming, recording, studio mode on and off, settings, and of course exit. And these are your transitions. And each scene has different sources. We can add audio capture devices from ALSA, which is like raw audio. We can capture input through Pulse Audio or capture output through Pulse Audio. We've got color sources, images, uh, image slideshow, jack input, which I'm using, various media sources. This is a plugin that I actually had to install. This is from New Tech, the makers of the TriCaster. It's an NDI source, lets you stream from one OBS to another uh, with minimal overhead. This lets you capture uh, scenes, screen capture, text. You can have a VLC video source video capture device such as my my camera that I'm using right now and we can capture windows and of course entire screens so these were two plugins that I installed uh, one's the WebSocket you know, WebSocket server settings is actually a backend that allows me to use Stream Copilot See up there, WebSocket connection. We can turn studio mode on and off. We can even switch scenes and change our transitions. We can basically control all of uh, OBS right, right from the phone. We can add filters to our audio, to our camera, all, all kinds of different controls and filters. It literally is like a TV studio in a program. Okay, so this is the simple screen recorder. It is nowhere near as uh, feature-packed as OBS is. But there are some times when it may come in handy when you may want to use it. I'm actually going to be using it to record a settings dialog, but I couldn't record while OBS is running. 
It does have uh, some decent features though. You can record all the major Linux audio services directly through the advanced Linux sound architecture, which is also. You can record pulse audio and of course the pro setting jack, which is of course what I'm going to be using. You can scale video down, change frame rates, and it can record the OpenGL. This is a pretty important aspect of live streaming or uh, recording with OBS on Linux, and that would be your hardware. I'm using the NVIDIA encoder, which is using my NVIDIA Quadro GPU to encode the uh, recording and the stream, whichever I'm doing. And if I did not have an NVIDIA graphics card, if I was using uh, Radeon, I would be forced to use uh, H.264 software encoding, which would mean the processor would be doing all of the work. That could be an issue depending on your processor or your, your whole setup. I had an AMD APU based laptop and it was very difficult to uh, get any type of decent performance. So some people say that you almost cannot do this type of work if you're not using NVIDIA. That's simply not true because all of the tutorial videos that are up on my channel were recorded on a system with a AMD R9290X, so I had to use the software encoder on my AMD FX8350. That's an 8-core system, and I was able to record them all in 1080p at 30 frames per second. Uh, alternatively, you can build OBS from source with a patch, and they have a VA API which works with Radeon cards for hardware encoding. Okay, so since I started recording this video, I actually got an update for OBS. It appears that they have added the VA API encoder uh, through FFmpeg. So like I said, this is an NVIDIA machine, so I cannot test it with a Radeon card, but I believe it will work with either or. So I just, I felt that that was completely necessary to add. I'm running OBS Studio version 23, so yeah, that is the new version. So up next, we're going to look at Caden Live as what I use for editing videos. Caden Live is only one video editor for Linux. There's there's other ones uh, like DaVinci Resolve, which most people have had a lot of problems installing DaVinci on anything besides CentOS and Red Hat systems. There is Lightworks, which has been used to edit many uh, major production films. And there's also Flowblade and Shotcut, but Caden Live is considered by many to be the best free and open source video editor for Linux. Uh, it has tons and tons and tons of effects. Uh, you can do color correction color editing, no no short on effects and editing properties. It also allows for the use of proxy clips which can make editing on lower powered hardware much easier. Um, for instance, before uh, I used to do a ton of editing, some of the videos that are already up on my channel I did between my my workstation at home and my my laptop. My laptop was using an 7th uh, generation AMD APU, so that would be based on uh, 
I believe it's Steamroller or Pile Driver. So this is pre Ryzen APU. And I mean, nowhere near as powerful as an i7 or probably most i5s. And it, the gr integrated graphics wouldn't really benefit with Caden Live. Uh, Caden Live does have some GPU support, but I haven't haven't really found it very useful but definitely definitely a, a powerful powerful video editor uh, if you have the time to learn it's it's capable of doing tons and tons of work I can't can't say enough good things about Caden Live Caden Live can also uh, do audio processing and separate your audio from your video it has a, a bunch of audio related plugins so you can do all of your audio work within Caden Live as well and there's a ton of awesome built-in uh, transitions I also use uh, Ocean Audio which is a little bit like Adobe Audition to do uh, my post-processing work on my audio. Maybe not quite as powerful as Audacity, but definitely gets the job done. And for images, you can edit images open Inkscape or whatever you have as your image editor straight from within Caden Live. Okay, now we're going to talk about audio production on Linux. And not just audio production, but audio processing, really. Because, like right now, I'm recording the audio you're hearing through jack it's a low latency and real-time sound system basically any type of professional audio production that you're going to be doing in linux you're probably going to want to be using jack and if you want to do audio production or even media production in general ubuntu studio is is pretty geared towards that um and then there's av linux which is audio video linux I've actually used AV Linux before and then most of the software that I use for audio production uh, I get from the KX Studio repositories. KX Studio is uh, a whole program. They make their own distro but they also provide repositories for other Linux distros to get high performance audio applications with you know certain uh, configurations to them. Ubuntu Studio uses a modified Linux kernel. It uses the low latency kernel. And AV Linux uses the real time kernel. Uh, the advantages and disadvantages of each are, you know, you can find people talking about them on audio forums. Having a real time kernel can negate some security features of, of Linux. And um, on Linux, security is a huge, huge priority as it's used in some of the most sensitive and secure servers and infrastructure systems in the world. The real-time kernel requires audio having unrestricted access to the kernel, to, to kernel space memory. And I believe that's why it poses a a risk of sorts. So right now I'm using Jack to record this and I'm actually processing the audio in the microphone here. This is a uh, Audio-Technica AT2020 Plus microphone. We've got a gate, an envelope filter, and a compressor. So if we turn the compressor off, now you see I'm, I'm a whole lot quieter we turn the gate off I get a little louder and if we turn the the uh, envelope filter off it's you know if we just compressed it it would be it would sound like this I and mean, 
you'd be able to hear the fans running because I have two Xeon machines running in the room with me. Uh, one is my server and the other one's the studio that I'm on right now. I, I think that I, I sound pretty good like this. this. This is after a lot of tweaking. These are audio plugins, so you could use these for whatever whatever application you wanted, really. If you were recording through an interface or if you had a drum track rolling, you can use these programs. They're pretty much interchangeable. That's part of what makes Jack so useful is that it provides a way to, to connect it, things together. This uh, Jack input client is through OBS. And these are the compressors. And basically it's a matter of running audio in and out of all of these back and forth. Okay, so this is LMMS. And this is my uh, digital audio workstation. And we there's lots of digital audio workstations on the next to choose from, uh, both free and paid. You've got uh, in the paid section, you've got Bitwig Studio, which is from the creators of Ableton Live, which is a you know well known. Uh, Harrison Mixbus is lesser known, but it's made by Harrison Consoles, which has been a huge name in uh, studio equipment for a long time. And then you've got Reaper. Harrison is built out of our door, which our door is 100% free. It's designed to be like a replacement for Pro Tools. So it's an all-in-one. It's got to focus on the ability to mix. Uh, this is the one I use, which is LMMS, which is designed to be a replacement for Free Loops. I've never tried Traction 7, but it was recently made open source or free to use on Linux. So yeah, this this is my current setup. I'm using Ubuntu 18.04, the long-term support version, which I just found out is going to be supported for the next 10 years. Uh, a lot of software for audio is from the KX Studio repositories. And then LMMS, which is an open source digital audio workstation. LMMS, by the way, stands for Linux Multimedia Studio. Um, we're connecting everything through Jack. And when I'm doing my OBS recording, I use CAF Studio gear. All right, so back to LMMS. I'm not going to explain how to do everything here. I'm just going to give you a little demonstration. I am, um, I'm controlling uh, this particular plugin over here, the SoundFun plugin, with a very affordable Akai MPK Mini MIDI controller.
I did that on the fly. I, uh, I hope that was a good enough example. This one's actually just a sound font, which if you search for the general user sound font, you'll find it for free. Uh, this one over here is called Olga, and you can also find that one available online, although it is not technically free. I believe it's free for certain purposes, such as this one. And LMMS comes with all of these uh, plugins pre-installed. And a lot of them are synthesizers video game sounds etc and so forth uh, most most of the things that you can do with uh fruity loops can be done with lmms and it's got a built-in uh kick drum system which once you get used to it you can make a lot of cool stuff So that's it. Uh, those are the tools that I use from my workflow for recording and editing video and audio, as well as doing 2D design for my own YouTube channel. Now, I hope someone out there finds this video helpful. Uh, if you're new to Linux and you're looking into creating content, or maybe you're already a content creator and you're thinking about trying Linux, even if you just want to use free and open source software on Windows and Mac OS. Uh, a lot of it is also available there. And if you've watched the whole thing, I appreciate your time more than you know. It's a lot of work, and having it seen makes it worth every minute. I try to add more value to each video I make in some way. I am a one-man channel, and I do work a full-time job. Please like, share, and subscribe. I seriously appreciate that, and I need all of the help I can get. And I thank you to all the subscribers that I already have. Any comments and criticism are always welcome, as well as requests and questions. I'd be glad to make videos you ask for, as well as more tutorials. I have some Android stuff in the pipeline, and I'm going to be trying... To make some tech news and uh, do some shorter projects. I'm also working on several new videos right now and I have tons more plans so check back and that's what I got. Uh, thanks for watching DS Tech Media. I'm Jay. I'll see you in the next one.